So, as Justin said a few minutes ago, we have been playing around with Isaiah through Advent. Playing is kind of a funny word, but yeah, we've been walking through Isaiah. And I will say, uh, for me, the exploration of the antiphons and really taking a look at them in some detail has been a a, a really fine blessing for me. Uh, I hope it has been for you as the listener in many ways that that you have received um, these antiphons. You can see the banners that were put in the side that are kind of giving us some visuals of these these images that came back, that were created back in the 400s. And what these ancient, our our church fathers are doing and trying to communicate to you and to me the message of Jesus in a very, very uh, descriptive way by titles and then images and pictures that we picked up on today. It seems right then on Christmas Day that we would talk about Isaiah 62 uh, and, and that we would actually look at the language that Isaiah is sharing in chapter 62 because you'll see that the title that we're really playing around with today is The Promise Fulfilled. So through, through Advent, we've been playing with The Promise Coming, and now we're looking at The Promise Fulfilled today, Christmas. And so we pick up a text in Isaiah 62, and really what we need to do is kind of look at the backstory of Isaiah 62, which I find really interesting. Uh, the backstory of Isaiah 62, first of all, you have to know Isaiah wrote at a period of time uh, where the Assyrian, Assyrian Empire, not the Syrian country, Assyrian Empire was beginning to rise up and was to dominate the known world at that day. In fact, we know that they came on as a strong and mighty power, and for a period of time, Uh, did some fairly terrible things to the nations they conquered. Isaiah's writing during that period, but the text he's talking about was looking ahead to another empire that was going to come. The role of a prophet at times is to foretell the future, is to look ahead and say, listen, you think the Assyrians are bad and we're gonna get through the Assyrians, but in Isaiah 62, he's really talking about the empire to come after the Assyrians, which is the Babylonians. And you all know uh, biblical history, you'll know that the Babylonians did conquer Jerusalem and they were taken into exile. And there was a dreaded thing that was happening with exile. Now, I don't know if you've ever felt separation or exile. I think in America, we have not experienced those kinds of things. We, we just haven't. We haven't had those places where uh, a country comes in and dominates you and, and then you're hauled away and forced into another land or another place. Goodness, the, the midst of what we deal with is North Korea attacking us over a movie, <laughs> uh, and uh, which now Sony is going to release, yeah. which I, I've already heard the reviews. It's a terrible movie. Uh, so, but w- some of us are going to go see it. Uh, but that's the extent, that's really the extent of our understanding of separation and exile by nation. But for them in the Middle East, in Isaiah's time, this was a dreaded fear. And the dreaded fear is that a conquering nation would come in, a power, a world power, and then everything about your life would be interrupted. And you would be sent in as a refuge, into refugee status someplace in another place. So what what Isaiah is talking about is the backdrop, the backstory of Isaiah 62 is that they've been hauled away into exile and everything seems hopeless. But amidst of hopelessness, there's something good. So Isaiah is writing before the exile happens? Yes. But he's looking forward to the time after the exile. Yes. So a lot of Isaiah is law. You keep rejecting God. You keep turning away from him. Uh, we saw that even in some of the O antiphons. You thought you're yeah. a forest. We're going to cut you down to a, the, the stumps, but there'll be a branch. King Ahaz, you're going to trust the Assyrians. You're not going to, I'm going to give you a sign. It's going to be Emmanuel. So all of that is before exile. Yes. And now exile is on its way. Yes. And our text today is looking beyond that. Beyond the exile. And by the way, I don't want to be described ever as a stump. (laughs) So Dan Flynn, the stump. Rosso, the stump. Yeah. Uh, that doesn't just seem all that hopeful to me. I, I yeah, guess, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but you are, <laughs> Justin, you're correct. What, what we have here is, is we have this, this, this story that you're all being hauled into exile. But what Isaiah 62 does is it gives us hope. Mm. Mm. And that's what he's doing with the listeners because he's painted this whole bad picture that Israel's going to be hauled away. I mean, wouldn't you like that job? You be the prophet and you tell people that your country's going to be destroyed and you're going to be hauled away into exile and your whole life is gonna be interrupted and you better like my message because I'm a prophet from God. (laughs) Uh, I'm just gonna tell you that he wasn't all that popular. But then he comes to Isaiah 62 and and now we get 
if you understand that hopelessness, then when you get to Isaiah 62, you begin to understand the hopefulness of the message. Because I'm gonna tell you, you, you all know out there, I, I think sometimes what's really striking to me is you can't really understand hope mm. unless you understand the hopelessness. Does that make sense? Unless you understand the desperation, you can't really understand the, the hope that comes into it. And I think that's what Isaiah does so well, is he's pointing us to the fact that there's a hopelessness, but now in Isaiah 62, he says, as much as this is all such a terrible thing, there is a point of hope. Yeah. And that's what I find in this text that we have today in Isaiah 62. So, so pivoting is that it's a word of hope to us. And he so, begins to use a word picture. So exile is a time of destruction, a time of judgment, a time of separation. You're taken off. I mean, everybody's yep. taken off in waves. They're first the nobles and then all the way down to the commoners, yep. men, women, children. Everybody's carted off, turned into slaves. Time of separation, judgment. And in the face of that, we get hope. So, so yeah, yeah. now point me, how do you see hope in this Isaiah 62 passage? Well, when you start today? looking at Isaiah 62, the language that we're giving is kind of a picture language. And when you look at Isaiah 62, it really begins to give us a glimpse of, of a promise that, that God has for Israel. And, and so he goes, pass through, pass through the gates. Prepare the way for the people. Well, who's passing through the gates? Who, who's the one passing through the gates to prepare for the people but God himself? So the Redeemer, God the Redeemer, God the Savior is going to bring them back home. They're going to come home. And God himself is going to go and prepare the way for it. And so I kind of like that picture. I mean, you're a metaphor guy. Uh, by the way, when you work with Justin, he lives by metaphor. That must put terrible stress on your marriage. <laughs> Everything as a metaphor. But, and, and I will say, as a staff, we play on metaphors. So when we're with Justin and a metaphor happens, we create more metaphors so that uh, you, these word pictures uh, to play with Justin. We they like, usually get it wrong. It's, it's okay. It's, yes, it's, and then he tells us that. He always tells us. So we have a picture here in Isaiah 62, and that's why I know... I find this, the picture, uh, images always speak to us. So he gives us a picture of a highway. Now, it's not a real highway. You don't have a major, you know, 275 or 23 <laughs> running into Jerusalem. You don't. So it's more like Washtenaw. <laughs> yeah, Washtenaw <laughs> at Christmas time. Yeah. <laughs> Just stay away. Uh, yeah, like Washtenaw. Okay. The two-laner. Uh, and, and so we have this picture of pass through, pass through the gates, and then we see build up, build up the highway. And, and a highway, you all know what a highway is. It, its intention is to be easy access to you from getting from point A to point B, right? So if you're traveling over the holidays, you're gonna get on the big highways and you, and you just wanna go from point A to point B, B and get through Ohio as quick as you can and uh, maybe stop at a Mickey D's, you know, or whatever. But everything's intended for quickness. And that's kind of the picture here is not only are we going to have the highway being built up, but a highway that's not usual in that world, mm -hmm. um, but a big one. And then you see the language. I love this phrase, remove the stones. Mm. Because what it says, when you say remove the stones, it means get rid of all the obstacles on the highway that stop carriages and wagons that would bring maybe the very old or the very young. Everyone is coming back. Yeah. Everyone is Everyone. coming back. Everyone. Not just the strong and the healthy and the young. Everyone has a place in this city. So build up, build up the highway, remove the stones. In Michigan, we would say, remove the potholes. Yeah, that's the build up the highway. Build, that's build, build up, not build it remove. Up, fill it. the hot poles, yep. potholes. Remove there, the, it's build remove up. Remove the orange it. cones. Yeah, yeah, you know, we, we're, yeah. we're used to that prepare the way for the king to come language, and you're thinking of get rid of the stones so the royal carriage can come. This is different than that. This, yes. is, this is not just the soldiers. This is everybody. This is the little kids and the infirm and the weak and the old ladies and the young children. Everybody's coming home, so you've got to make the way and straight. And that, that, is, that is interesting because we always think of the royalty getting the big roads. Yeah. So if the president flies into Ann Arbor, which he does on occasion, everything stops. Yeah. Everything. I mean, he's, his limousine's coming, and, it's, and security and all that stuff, everything stops, because they get the highway. Yeah. They, they, the elite, get the highway. That's not what's being said here. 
In fact, what it's saying is, we're the elite. Yeah. You and I are the kings and the queens, and we get the highway. And the obstacles are all removed, and we can enter into the city. And then it says, uh, there are two more things I want to say to this. Is, one, it says, see your Savior comes. The Lord has made proclamation. You're all coming home. Your Savior comes for you. He's coming for you. So no matter your circumstances, he's coming for you. And then second, when he comes for you, he gives you a new name. Now, we're going to do the Old Testament names, which I always think are kind of funny in our world, and we'll talk about New Testament names a bit later. But here's, here's what he says. Here's the Old Testament names. So when you come, you're going to get a new name. Does your, does your name mean something? Yeah, it means you have an identity, right? To know your name is to know your identity, something of you. And this is what this text says. They will be called holy people, the redeemed of the Lord, sought after. Interesting, isn't it? God sought after them. The city no longer deserted. So a city that was destroyed and emptied is no longer deserted, but is filled. It's filled. You get a new name. So, Justin, when we look at this, it's, it's obviously Christmas, right? Yeah. yeah. So, it's so today, yeah. I, yeah, it's yeah, yeah. I, the trees, the lights, yeah. uh, uh, the, the little graphic on the screen. What does this have to do with Jesus? Hmm. So you look at Isaiah. What, what does it all have to do with Jesus? Yeah, there's a, there's a New Testament text that says all of God's promises are yes in Jesus Christ. So even in this Old Testament promise, we see fulfilled in the person and work of Jesus for us. There is a time when the people of God come back from exile. The highway is not nearly as good as this text kind of makes it seem. And when they're planted back in the land, life is good, but not nearly as good as the promises seem to be. So this promise has a near fulfillment simply in the history of God's people with Ezra and Nehemiah. And yet, do you remember the story when they built the new temple? Some were cheering and some were weeping, and the ones weeping were the ones that remembered how good it used to be. And this is so much smaller and seems so much less significant. So there's a fulfillment to this promise in the life of God's people, and yet in Jesus, God's yes to all his promises, we see it fulfilled as well. So you start wondering, how does Jesus fit in with the, this text from yep. today? And some of the same things you said about, uh, about God himself preparing a way, the Lord, Emmanuel, uh, Jesus himself as God the Lord preparing a way for us. So does Jesus build up a highway for us? Does he restore this relationship, this go-between between between us and between God? Does he fill in the potholes and make that way clear for us to enter into God's presence? That you think about what it means to have the banner for the nations raised, a rally point. We're all going home and we want everybody to come with us, so we're going to raise the banner because we're going out of exile and we're heading home. Jesus said in John, I will when I am raised up, I will call all people to myself. Of course, he was talking about his cross. When Jesus was raised on the cross, that's the banner, the sign. So isn't, we isn't all it, get to go home. I, I love that, that picture, and I even thought about this until you were saying it, is the raising up of Jesus becomes that banner. Yeah. Becomes the symbol that all people will see. Because that's what the banner was for. It was to say, we're all coming home. Yeah, it's the rally flag. Yeah, well, yeah, we're going home, flag. so let's get together. Mm -hmm. that, that's what the cross yeah. is. We're all going home. Come on and gather together. Remove the stones. You talk about removing yeah. the stones. Remove the stones. And I think not of uh, the first Christmas morning, but the first Easter morning. And the question of the women, who's, who's going to remove the stone? How, how are we going to have access? How do, we, how do we get to this Jesus guy? Who's going to remove the stone? And they get there and it's been <laughs> blown apart, man. Just Jesus in his death and resurrection removes the barriers, removes the stone, makes it a way not just for the mighty, but, but makes a way for the most humble to come home. And that's perhaps the most significant thing for us to hear out of this text today, too, is that it's not us who's preparing a way for Jesus. Uh, that was Advent, wasn't it? In Advent, we prepare the way. You hear John the Baptist say, prepare the way of the Lord. We get our houses ready for Christmas. We get our hearts ready for Jesus. And we get to Christmas Day, and the message is this, Jesus is preparing for you. Jesus is preparing a way for you. Jesus is preparing a way home for the great and the small, for the weak and 
for the infirm, and everybody's going to come. Old women and the young children. He's making a way for everyone. You know, Jesus told that to his disciples. I'm going to prepare a way mm -hmm. for you. And Thomas, good old Thomas, said, I, with Jesus, we don't know where you're going. We don't know, we don't know where you're going. How do we know the way? You remember Jesus' I response? What would Jesus say? I, I am the way. He said, I am, I am the, the way, the truth, the life. The truth and the life. And, no one comes to the Father. And what I think was funny in that conversation is that Thomas, Jesus says, well, Thomas, if you know me, you know. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think, well, I never will ask a question again. <laughs> you know, it's the old classroom thing, keep your head down, the teacher won't call on you, and certainly don't raise your hand. Um, but, but it is, Thomas, if you knew me, and I think, man, we all wrestle with that, yeah. don't we? We all wrestle with that. The banner's lifted, but we still keep asking the question. That's why it's such a comfort to know it's not there just for the royalty. It's there for the weak and infirm mm -hmm. and those who have little faith and those who doubt and those who don't get Jesus still. Yet the way's open. He's, prepared, he's removed the stones and prepared the way. Mm -hmm. That's what Christmas is all mm -hmm. about. What's striking to me is uh, each of us wrestles with a separation in our life. Because the world we live in, that's why we do a confession of sins, is we always acknowledge out loud that there's a brokenness and a separation. That we live, mm -hmm. I, I think, Justin, really kind of a graphic word is we all live in exile. Hmm. You may not be a nation attacked by another nation and put in exile, but I think we all wrestle with the idea of being in exile. My mom died on May 1st. Uh, I knew my mom was declining in health. Um, my brother and I would talk, and when we'd see my mom, and, and he and I would say, well, we know it's coming, and then the question that, the children will ask, uh, all right, how are we gonna take care of dad? My dad's 86, so how are we gonna take care of dad? Because my dad spent 60 years taking care of mom. And now that 60 years is, you know, done. And I will say Christmas has been weird for me. My mom elevated Christmas beyond what it should have been <laughs> elevated, I'm just telling you. Uh, Christmas was always more than Christmas should be. Um, and I will say, when your child is one year old and we lived in Baltimore, Maryland, and she sent us, I, I would say, a semi of, of Christmas <laughs> gifts. And, and Emily was one. And, she, and we opened gifts on Christmas Eve. And we, opened, we were trying to get through because we had to call my mother so we could describe Emily's responses to all these presents. And we, and we had to keep her awake you have to open up another one because uh, my mom's going to ask specific things. She always went overboard in these things uh, with that and with food. The trouble is we've all gotten older and she, keep, she kept preparing the same amount of food and then she got mad when we didn't eat it. So Christmas is weird right now, Justin. It, yeah. it has been. It, it's been... Um, I've, I've bottled the emotion. Mm -hmm. I just departmentalized it. But it's been really strange. Last night, after we opened our gifts, we, uh, it took some technology doing, but we Skyped my dad, because he's, he's with my brother right now and his family, which has been really, really good. And my dad's not, he couldn't stay at the house. And, and I know, even as we're talking on Skype, which is, I'm just telling you, that's funny in itself with my dad. Um, everybody knows the elephant in the room. Mom's gone. My mom's birthday is December 31st. So my dad's getting hit with Christmas and with my mom's birthday. It's my mom. Now, maybe you've experienced something like that this year, but I, I see that as separation. Yeah, that's the, that's the exile he described, the, the separation, the experience, even at Christmas time, uh, that the world isn't the way it's supposed to be. Christmas in exile, so to speak. Yes. Um, you that's don't share that. That's a good that. sermon series title. Yeah, we'll have to look That'll at that bring for in next people. year. That'll yeah, bring Christmas them in, man. That, that'll yeah. bring them in, yeah. yeah. Christmas in exile. Christmas in exile. I want to go to that worship service. Yeah. <laughs> I, well, and that's the thing. That's that you run the risk. You share that, Dan, personally. And, and, and I talked a couple weeks ago. My grandpa just died, and you know my father-in-law died this summer. And it's 
on our hearts, it's on our minds, but it's on everyone's hearts and minds too. It's, it's not the Dan Flynn and Justin Rosso show. Mm. And it's not supposed to be a downer for Christmas. It's simply recognizing this in your life too. You experience separation. You're living and even celebrating Christmas in the midst of exile. Things are not yet the way they're supposed to be. Do we rejoice and do we sing hymns? Absolutely, because we have a promise. Do we open gifts and, and, and give presents? Absolutely, we're here to celebrate. Are we gonna sit down and eat food and, and talk to family and laugh and maybe have a Lutheran beverage or two? Yes, yes, uh, yes. Um, <laughs> but all the celebration, this side of the eternal celebration, has this reality embedded in it. We still live in a time of separation. We still celebrate under the shadow of exile. When, I, when Jesus dies and resurrects and the church starts, and I, I guess it would have been kind of fun to have been those apostles on those first days, but mm. there's Peter who experiences everything about the resurrection all the hopelessness that he had experienced in his life, all the emptiness. We know Jesus experienced exile. Mm. He left the kingdom, he experienced it. I said last night at Living Water, we were talking about Joseph, and I said, uh, the one thing that we forget is Joseph, Matthew 1, has his moment with the angel, and he raises a baby. But when Jesus is not a man, when he's 30 and starts his ministry, we don't hear about Joseph. Well, what does that mean? Joseph died. And that really meant something to me. Jesus came to be with us. He came into the exile. And his own dad died. <laughs> and he grieved. Like I grieve. Like you would grieve. And each of us has kind of an exile. It may not be death. This, this year has kind of been a a watershed moment, and I know for you, oh my goodness, this has been a really tough year. But I know others have different kinds of exiles. There's a brokenness in families, and Christmas we're all supposed to be happy, but all of the stuff that's festering kind of comes out. And then we say, the highway, the banner's been lifted up. And Peter writes at the end of his life, he writes in his epistle these fine words, and, and he gives a name to you and to me. And he says this, listen, you, you people of Jesus, you living in exile, you are God's chosen people. You're chosen. He came out of the gate to get us. You're chosen. He says, you're a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation, you people of God. And I love this one. You're God's special possession. You're God's special possession. And Peter goes on in verse 10, chapter 2. He says, once you were not a people, but now you're the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. That's the message for you this Christmas, this Christmas still in exile. You are God's special chosen people already now. And the thing about living in exile is we can rejoice and celebrate even now because we know God isn't done keeping his promises. God fulfilled his promises in Jesus, and God is not yet done fulfilling his promises in Jesus. Those names, the names that are given to you in Jesus, special ones, royal priesthood, God's special possession, those are true, and yet they're going to come true even more. We celebrate Christmas today, and yet we celebrate in exile. The day is coming when we will celebrate Christmas, eternal Christmas, face to face. You see, that's our promise. 
We're going home. Jesus is preparing a way for us. He's lifted up a banner. He's removed the stones. There's a highway. He himself is the way home. And there will come a day when you will celebrate Christmas no longer missing someone you love. You will celebrate Christmas no longer stepping on other people's toes. You will celebrate Christmas no longer wondering how you're going to make it through this weekend or how you're going to pay the bills next Monday. You will celebrate Christmas Home in the promised land, face to face. You had a note from Jim. Sh- share yeah, that. Yeah, I, I do. I want to share that. It's, it's something we found just recently uh, as a family. We found it on his iPad. And, and uh, my father-in-law, uh, I mean, I called him dad. My father-in-law, Jim, died this last summer. And this comes in June. This is not long before he died. And I just want to share you briefly a couple things from this note because it's what it means to celebrate with hope in the face of separation. So he's writing to the board of ACMIS. It was a, a business organization. He served as their executive director in retirement. And, and Jim writes, The week of June 9th was a watershed for me. On Tuesday evening, I went to the emergency room because of some new pain I was experiencing and a redness around the tumor area. It was determined I had an infection. This infection was also found in my clavicle bone. Nothing further can be done medically with surgery, radiation, or chemo. With my family with me, we decided it was time to enter hospice care. I'm at home and comfortable enjoying the lake and family. And then he goes on to say he can't be trusted with major decisions, so he needs to resign immediately as executive director. And he goes on to have some words of encouragement about the future of this organization he'd been a part of. And he ends sending this letter to a public organization. He ends with a thought of his own future. And and this is really what I wanted to share with you today. Jim writes, as for me, I know my future, a future created by and freely given to me by my Savior. That future is eternal life with my Lord. All glory be to God. All glory to God. That's what it means to celebrate in hope in the face of separation. Jim knew, Jim knew it wasn't going to be long before he went home, but he also knew he had a gift. He had a promise. He had a future. So our future, Revelation 21, verses 22 to 26. This really speaks to me. This is our future when we enter into the new Jerusalem. John writes in his revelation, I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it. For the glory of God gives it light, and the Lamb is its lamp. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. Oh, no day will its gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there. The glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it the banner lifted high the highway open we get to go in you chosen people of god you royal priesthood you holy nation you get to go in and we run into the city into the lights into the light that's the promise fulfilled it's our promise In Jesus' name, amen.